Welcome to the Low Carb Conferences podcast. I'm your host, Dr. Jeff Gerber. And today our special guest is Dr. Richard Johnson, and he'll be speaking at our conference in February. Richard's been a big supporter of the event, and we finally get to get him as a speaker. It seems like it's been way too long. So how's it going, Richard? Hey, great, Jeff. It's really wonderful to uh, meet with you uh, by Zoom, though. <laughs> Yeah, well, we're we're neighbors, and uh, yeah. sometimes it's just easier to do it this way. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, so a little bit more about Richard. Uh, he's a professor of medicine at the University of Colorado and is a clinician, educator, researcher, lecturer, and author. He's board certified in internal medicine, infectious disease, and kidney disease. For more than 20 years, he's led research on the cause of obesity and diabetes with special interest in the role of sugar, especially fructose and uric acid. He lectures all over the world, has published over 700 papers, and is recognized as a leader in his field. He's now authored three books, including his latest, Nature's Wants Us to Be Fat, which I have right here in the background. And best of all, as we mentioned, Richard lives right here in Colorado, and we've known each other personally for years. So Richard, if you can provide us with some more background and tell us about your professional and personal interests. Sure. Okay. So as you mentioned, uh, I'm a professor of medicine. Uh, I've spent all my life in academic medicine. Uh, I, I really enjoy clinical practice. Uh, and so I've been a clinician, but I've had a very major research interest <laughs> and for Gosh, I, I hate to say how many years, but for decades, I've been doing uh, research. And since about 1997 or so, I've become very interested in the cause of obesity, the cause of diabetes, um, big questions. And uh, our work has led us to the discovery of, of a pathway that we think is really, really involved in driving obesity. Um, and I've written about it. It actually appears to be like a biologic switch that's turned on and off by the, and uh, it's how animals, uh, we believe it's how animals prepare for things like hibernation when they get really fat right before they hibernate. And, uh, and it involves carbs. And so my road uh, took me into the world of, of carbs and low carb diets. And because it, it seems to be such an effective method for addressing this uh, switch. But uh, we had some other surprises that I'm really going to be happy to share with you other tricks on how to lose weight based upon this uh, biologic switch. And uh, so that's the nutshell. I'm still doing active research. Uh, we've even discovered that this uh, pathway that's driving obesity that involves sugar also drives alcoholism. So I uh, have a very big grant right now where we're trying to show that when you block sugar pathways, you actually can block alcoholism. So it's really a, a very exciting thing. It's also taken us into the world of Alzheimer's disease. It's taken us into the world of dementias and behavioral disorders uh, into cancer. So this pathway turns out to be very important and to be driving a lot of, of things. It's, it's quite upstream. So uh, it's really initiated by diet. And, uh, and so I, I'm really looking forward to coming and speaking at, your, uh, at this great event and uh, sharing my, our, our breakthroughs with the group and, uh, and then discussing it and challenging it or being, you know, being challenged. I'm looking forward to nice discussions. Um, yeah. yeah, well, that that's great, Richard. It sounds like you've gotten into the area of um, uh, brain health. Uh, yes. You just mentioned a, a whole lot about uh, aging and yes. uh, re the reward system. Oh, yeah, absolutely. yeah. So, so the 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 switch. I don't know. Do you want me to talk just a little bit about how the switch works, or not yet? I do, but if if we can back up a little bit, sure. So I'm always intrigued that uh, you your main field has been the study of kidneys and nephrology, and I, I I'd, I'd like you to share us share with us a little more information about how it, it maybe it started as kidney research and then it led you down this this path to uh, obesity. Yeah. Okay. Sure. Absolutely. So. Um, I was very interested in what caused kidney disease. 
And he, I was interested in things like diabetes and how it caused kidney disease and in general. And, and also I was very interested in high blood pressure and high blood pressure is thought to be due to a defect in the kidneys where they can't excrete salt very well. And so I, I got the idea that, that it might be some kind of acquired injury to the kidney that then blocked the ability for the kidney to get rid of salt. And I was studying that. And we had this very cool surprise where we could make animals uh, develop high blood pressure in response to salt by just causing really subtle kidney damage. So subtle that the kidney functions normal, um, you know, everything looks normal, but if you actually look in the kidney, you can see evidence that there's subtle things going on. And so I started there. So I, I was trying to figure out the cause of high blood pressure. And actually our work really has uh, really shed light on that. And because uh, it turns out that it is subtle injury to the kidney that seems to be driving high blood pressure, a uh, subtle inflammation, actually. As we were looking at what caused that subtle inflammation, it took me to a substance called uric acid. And people with high uric acid have a very, very high frequency of developing high blood pressure. And, um, and we found that, uh, you know, uric acid is usually associated with a disease called gout, but it's actually very strongly associated with obesity and high blood pressure. And uh, we actually found that when we raised uric acid in animals, they got that subtle kidney damage over time that caused hypertension. So now I had a link between uric acid and blood pressure. And then the question was, well, okay, so if uric acid's involved, and that, we actually studied kids, and we found that kids presenting with high blood pressure all had high uric acids. And we did this big study, we published it in the JAMA, which is a big medical journal. And we found that when we lowered the uric acid, we could correct the blood pressure. It turns out that this uric acid blood pressure link is, is, occurs in early hypertension. And over time, you get the subtle kidney damage. And then once you have the subtle kidney damage, then it's the kidney that drives high blood pressure. So this is like the initiator, not necessarily the thing that continues causing hypertension over, over a lifetime. So then we were <laughs> thinking, okay, well, uric acid is really important. And then uh, I wrote an editorial on this for the New England Journal, and I got interviewed uh, by Gary Tobbs. This is right, right around 2000. And so we were talking about how uric acid seems to be linked with high blood pressure and obesity. And so we started talking on the phone about what makes uric acid go up. And, you know, the classic teaching is that it's, it's purines. It's like uh, often meaty foods, but actually it's known that sugar and especially fructose can raise uric acid. And so when I was talking to Gary and he says, well, what do you think's driving up the uric acid? I said, well, I, I do think it, it could be sugar. And of course that he was just getting an, interested in sugar at the time as well. And so we talked for quite a bit on, on sugar and its potential to possibly drive this uric acid up. And at that point, um, you know, I had already sort of decided to do an experiment, but it really, that discussion made me want to do it all the more. And we put animals on fructose, which is the component of sugar that dries up uric acid. And when we put the animals on fructose, their uric acids went up and they became hypertensive. And then we gave them a drug to lower the uric acid, thinking that that, you know, will it lower the blood pressure? Well, guess what? It didn't just lower the blood pressure. It blocked weight gain and blocked the rise in triglycerides and blocked uh, uh, fat uh, formation and blocked fatty liver to some extent. It was like, what? Lowering uric acid has a benefit like this? And it's like, an er again, it's an early effect. Uh, it's not like uh, what happens with obesity is, is uh, the, these uh, this pathway is involved early on. And then what happens is we start reducing our mitochondria. They get damaged through this process. And then you kind of get trapped a little bit into uh, being overweight where lowering uric acid doesn't show as much benefit. So it's really an early, early effect. Yeah. I want you to go on. So it sounds like you found a, a, a marketable drug that uh, treats obesity. <laughs> yes, actually. So when we did do some clinical studies and we found that it actually uh, does lower or reduce weight. Um, uh, it really is more effective at preventing weight gain than it is at reducing weight. To, to really, once you get fat, 
you really had to lose the weight. You have to do the classic thing like calorie restriction and or go on a low carb diet or something, you know, these kind of classic intermittent fasting because you got to burn off the fat. So I'm looking at what causes the fat to, to go up. So when you block uric acid, you have a better effect at blocking weight gain than you do at blocking um, or it's inducing weight loss. But yeah. it's, it, it is, it does look like it, you know, I mean, we, we, we've shown that it's, uh, that in several, several trials that we can block weight gain. And actually in some of these trials, we've seen some weight loss, but it's uh, relatively mild. Uh, we do think that if you can block fructose metabolism, that you'll have a winning drug. And there's now large numbers of companies that are trying to make drugs to block fructose metabolism. And yeah, well, Eli Richard, I, and yeah, I, you know, I'm, I'm, I, th we're talking about nutrition today, but uh, it was just interesting because now, now you have substances, and I don't even know if you yeah. can name that substances. Yeah, those substances, they're, they're probably research. Uh, material yeah. at the present time, but uh, this is just interesting that you mentioned that. Yeah. So anyway, so then we started studying fructose. We go, oh my gosh, fructose is, is inducing this thing. And here, when we lower uric acid, we're blocking some of fructose effects, but lowering uric acid doesn't block the calories of fructose at all. It's so, so it was some kind of, the fructose was doing something independently of calories. And that is what really launched it. So right around 2002 or 2003, I became a fructose doctor and, um, and I've been studying sugar and fructose since. And, um, and we've kind of discovered that this fructose pathway turns out to be much bigger than we had thought. So uh, go ahead. <laughs> yeah. So uh, I, thanks for sharing that. I, I didn't realize that uh, it was Gary Taubes, a science reporter that uh, sparked and piqued your interest in uh, in fructose, so we, we do yeah. have to give him some credit for that. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, you know, we we had been talking a little bit about it, but it was really that conversation that made me when I hung up. I go, you know what? We just have to put these animals on fructose. Yeah. yeah. Wow. Uh, yeah. That that's just fascinating. Yeah. And so uh, I want to go down that rabbit hole a little bit deeper, but. I, I know that you, you travel all over the world and <laughs> yeah. it, it, perhaps it's with your wife. You must enjoy traveling. Uh, but what is the nature of these, these trips? Is, is it to discuss your research? Is it this, to discuss your book? Is it, is it one in the same? What are you doing? Well, I do travel a lot. Um, I am fortunate enough that my research has uh, attracted a lot of attention. And uh, so I end up going and giving lectures about my work. I have two major areas of work. The, my major area has been on the cause of obesity and diabetes, as I mentioned, and the role of sugar. But also uh, our work took us into trying to understand how climate change affects health. And I've done a lot of work on climate change. Uh, especially as how it can affect kidney disease, but also now we're looking at how it can drive obesity and diabetes and things like that. So, so uh, uh, probably half of my traveling is related to uh, speaking related to climate change and its effects on health. Um, and probably half or maybe a little more than half focuses on fructose. Um, there's a huge epidemic of kidney disease going on uh, in Central America, India. Uh, that's we, we link to climate change. We think it's the first epidemic from ongoing climate change. It is partly linked with fructose because um, we can, uh, it's kind of complicated, but a lot of these people are out working in the fields and they're drinking the wrong kind of hydration fluid. So they're drinking sweet, sweetened drinks that really uh, can cause problems when you're dehydrated. You shouldn't be drinking soft drinks. They're dehydrating anyway, and they really can cause obesity. But if you're drinking it as trying to hydrate yourself while you're working out in the fields, it's really, really an error. It can cause kidney damage and all kinds of things. So, uh, so, so that's mainly, I was recently in London. There was a fantastic <clears throat> conference on obesity. It was just... I saw that the New York Times did a little write-up on it last week. 
Uh, but this was a meeting <clears throat> to try to uh, bring together the different theories of obesity. <clears throat> and I was able to present my theory. And I'm happy to tell you that I do think that our work can bridge a lot of the different obesity theories out there. And uh, I've written uh, a paper that uh, tries to unite the different evidences and shows that everything actually fits. Um, and even the people who talk about a calorie as a calorie, um, you can actually show how this carb pathway can can be associated with that. So it's sort of cool. I, I don't know if you want me to try to explain that or not, but... We Hold the thought. I, I, I really want to discuss that because the theme of our conference is where is nutrition headed? And, and we're trying to right. find some common themes and, and bring right. it together. And I always joke that, uh, you know, our genetics haven't changed, but right. the conversation always changes. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. But uh, I, I'm very interested in the environmental issue. And, and I thought I heard you say that uh, the environment is making us ill. I, I thought oh, it was, yes. the, you know, that, that we're making the environment ill but uh, it, it, yeah, there's two you know oh. so if you think about it in big big scope uh in the last 150 years 60 years the dominant diseases that we're having are things like obesity diabetes fatty liver you know high blood pressure and these are all nested together and linked they're all very much correlated with each other and we're figuring out what causes that and i think there's going to be a time coming not too far from now, where we're going to really be able to, to reduce those diseases dramatically. And, uh, but what's happening is there's a new set of diseases that are just beginning to show themselves. And these are diseases of the environment. There are a lot of them are toxins. We, we've been identifying toxins as causing kidney disease and other problems uh, from the environment. Uh, and also uh, climate change, really chronic heat stress, dehydration, they trigger their own sets of diseases. And so I do believe that we're at the cusp where we're, we're actually going to start, you know, you, you don't see it yet, but there's so many breakthroughs going on in obesity and diabetes. These diseases, they're going to go away. They're going to go away. Uh, I predict 30 years from now, there won't be too many cases of type two diabetes and there won't be that much obesity. It's, I, I think that people are figuring out uh, what causes it. You know, the, the low carb diet was a great, really a fantastic start, but, uh, but I think that there, there are going to be uh, other ways that people are going to block this in the future. And um, so I, I, I could be wrong. <laughs> I could be wrong, but I, but I, I really believe we're on that cusp, just like it was in 1890, where before 1890, what was killing everybody was infectious diseases. And then we got antibiotics and vaccines and all these other things came between about 1870 and 1940. And it was able to really suppress a lot of that. Now, not completely. We're still fighting viral infections and so forth. But but we really had a big break where we were when the, with the onset of antibiotics and good public hygiene and and then then these new diseases came up. You know, I mean, obesity, high blood pressure. They they were rare before 1890, and by 1970 they were just taking over the world and they they're still kind of in charge of of most of the health issues of the world seem to be related to these diseases and so but i think we're gonna we're gonna see a transition well well richard we have your prediction uh recorded so <laughs> let's let's stay stay tuned and that that really brings us some hope and just to finish up with the environment issue so you really uh, make the point that uh, the environment is is an is issue that's important oh, yeah. in both directions. And, you know, from our perspective, we think that uh, th there's three important things to consider, and that is our health, the environment, and the ethical treatment of animals. And we all care about that. I agree 100%. We have to take care of the animals and nature, just as we, you know, our, the impact of our civilizations are really can have a very negative impact, not on just 
the regular environment and, and toxins and everything, but it carries over to the animals in the world and the plants. Yeah. I'm, I'm a big believer in, in humanity and, and the, the love of animals. And, um, and even though I do research that involves some animal research, it's always done in the most humane way. And only, we only do it when it's absolutely necessary. Good, Richard. Well, listen, let's take a dive into what you described a couple minutes ago as this unifying principle yeah. that kind of brings all of our ideas about the nutrition together. Yeah. So, so our work initially suggested that fructose was really a, something was special about it. It was working some different way than just a regular calorie. And we found that when we gave fructose to animals, they developed this thing called the metabolic syndrome and they became obese and they, their triglycerides went up, their, their got fatty liver, their blood pressure went up. It was the same thing that we call metabolic syndrome. And we we, uh, but, but also there were other parts of it that are probably part of the metabolic syndrome as well, but we just not well characterized and it induced hunger. It induced thirst. It induced foraging behavior where animals would forage for food. It dropped the resting metabolism, but it's, it left energy available for when you're foraging so that it kind of helped balance things out. And it also uh, increased fat, not just in, in the fat tissues, but in the liver and the blood. Um, it raised blood pressure. It did a really interesting thing. It actually protects animals from low oxygen states. And the way it does that is it the mitochondria make all the energy in the body. Uh, they, they make it, well, they don't make all the energy, but they make a lot of the energy and we call it ATP. And there's really two types of energy. There's the energy we use, which is the ATP. And then there's the energy we store, which is fat. And uh, when you make, when the mitochondria make ATP, they use oxygen and that's really where we get our oxygen, where we use our oxygen, a lot of it. And so what happens is, when you eat fructose, it suppresses the energy production by the mitochondria. So they make less ATP and so they use less oxygen. So an animal can survive in a burrow, like a, a low oxygen hypoxic type environment. They can survive if they switch to fructose metabolism. Um, and so um, it's sort of like the Warburg effect. Uh, you know, these, these animals can live on a low oxygen because they're not relying on the mitochondria to make so much energy. They live with a low energy state. And so the calories they eat, instead of going to the mitochondria, they're, 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 they're turned into stored energy like fat. So it shunts the calories in towards fat. And that's how this fructose works. It drops the ATP in the cell, creating kind of a low energy state, but it's not a low total energy because the stored energy builds up. And does, so it's uh, kind of a brilliant system. Does fermentation play a role in that as well? That it shifts to fermentation? Yeah, so, yeah a little bit actually. But um, what happens is, yeah, you get this thing called glycolysis where um, animals will, there is another way to make energy. It's a more primitive way you, and, and they can make it from glucose and um, it's called glycolysis. And so that goes up. And interesting, um, you know, like cancer cells also, they, they are in a low oxygen state because when they metastasize, they, they don't have a good uh, blood supply initially. They have to generate a blood supply. So they kind of live in a low oxygen state. So they love fructose as a fuel because it helps them. And so there are all these cancers that, that you can increase the, the, their, their growth rapidly by giving them fructose or uric acid, because uric acid suppresses the mitochondria too. This and is so, in animal models, correct? Yeah, in animal models. So like if I raise uric acid in a mouse and then inject it with a tumor, it rapidly spreads throughout the body. And so it turns out that a bunch of cancers are associated with obesity and they're all the ones that seem to like fructose. Not all cancers like fructose, but so there is this big story coming that sugar and fructose are involved in cancers. And it's, it's actually part of this biologic response. It was meant to be a survival response, help animals prepare for when there's no food available. Uh, and so, or when there's no oxygen or when there's no water. 
fat is also a source of water. So if an animal gets fat, it can break down the fat to provide water. That's why camels have a hump and, you know, so when they need the water, they can break it down. And why whales are so fat, it isn't just for insulation. They use the fat as a source of water. So this process of creating this, the, taking fructose is what animals love to do to try to prepare for times when there's not uh, good resources around. So it was meant to be a survival thing. The problem is, is uh, two things happened. We, we had a mutation in uric acid where we have higher uric acids. And the effect of that was to make us much more sensitive to sugar. So we, we are very sensitive to the effects of sugar. And then the second problem is that sugar intake went way up and high fructose corn syrup intake went way up. And that combination uh, switched us from protecting us from starvation to actively driving us to be fat. So it's a very interesting thing. And I knew that things like French fries that don't have much sugar in them, they, they're not good, you know, they're fattening. And so, uh, you know, I realized that there was something missing in my story. And um, w working with all these uh, researchers in my lab and others, especially a guy named Miguel Lenaspa, we, we started looking at this and we realized that not only is it the fructose that we eat, but our bodies can make fructose and they make fructose from carbs. They make it, they make fructose from glucose. And so it turns out that when you're eating potatoes and rice and bread and that blood glucose goes up after we eat, we call it the, you know, postprandial hyperglycemia, or, you know, basically these are what we call high glycemic foods. So when you eat them, the glucose levels go up in the blood. When it goes up in the blood, it doesn't just trigger insulin. It actually triggers the conversion of glucose to fructose. So, and there's now been shown in people too, so that if you give a high glycemic uh, diet of foods to people, they will start making fructose. And um, so the you can make fructose from carbs. And the classic one is these high glycemic carbs. And it turns out that salt activates the conversion. So it stimulates the conversion. And so when you go on a low carb diet, not only are you blocking the fructose you eat, but because you're on a low carb diet, you don't really get these high, high glucose levels because you're not eating much carbs. You can make glucose, but you don't make enough to actually drive your blood glucose up. And what happens is you, you block the fructose formation too. So the low carb diet is just fantastic at blocking this pathway. And even the salt, if, you're, if you eat salt, but you're in a low carb diet, it's not gonna be a problem because the way salt works is it converts glucose to fructose. So if there's no glucose around, you can be on a high salt diet uh, and a low carb diet. And as you know, the first week or two, uh, when you're on a low carb diet, you lose water and salt. It's actually good to, to have that. So, so that was kind of the big breakthrough was realizing that um, fructose can also be made. And that led me to this, uh, to really the power of the low carb diet. And then I, I've actually realized the importance of calories as well. And, um, and the insight there is that we did these studies and we found that if we put animals on a, on a high carb diet, and especially if they start making fructose, that they lose their ability to regulate their weight and they start gaining weight. And it's because they develop a thing called leptin resistance. And leptin is a hormone that blocks um or stimulates satiety. So it, it, it makes you feel full and it goes up to tell you to quit eating. But people who are overweight often are resistant to the effects of leptin. And uh, what causes that leptin resistance appears to be fructose. We've done a number of studies, fat doesn't do it, but fructose does. And so when you're on a high carb diet, you become leptin resistant. So then once you're leptin resistant, the best way to gain weight is to actually eat fat because fat has like nine calories per, per gram. I mean, nine, uh, nine calories per gram versus four calories per gram for carbs. And so what happens is, uh, you know, if you're on a high fat diet and you're left in resistance, your weight goes up fast. And if you go on a low fat diet, well, you're left in resistance, your weight comes down because the fat is like the firewood, but the fire is actually the fructose. So 
the you know so it went but when you're on a low carb diet there's no leptin resistance so you can eat that high fat diet and you're not going to get into trouble uh and so suddenly i can explain these things and um and then i realized that the people who say a calorie is a calorie they're looking at people who are already leptin resistant where fat really is driving weight gain but we who are in the carb world know that if you go on a low carb diet, you can really have better, better outcomes. And it's because you're getting at the actual cause of what's driving this whole metabolic syndrome. And the other a wonderful thing is that when you go on a carb restriction, you also block you know, insulin resistance and all these other blood pressure and a lot of things that are not so much driven by fat, but are driven by this pathway, this fructose pathway. Yeah. Wow, Richard, that that's just absolutely fascinating. Yeah. And, you know, um, it, it, it does kind of unify and bring things together. Yeah. And it also brings up the con concept of uh, body composition. So yes. If, if we have a normal body composition, so we're, we're lean and muscular, uh, you're basically saying we can metabolize uh, nutrition in, in, properly. And so, but the problem is not everyone has this normal body composition. So we're right. dealing with people with that are overweight and then they're leptin resistance. And, and, you know, it brings up this, this concept. And I know Gary Taubes has said it in the past. Uh, are we over, uh, you know, do we, are we overweight because we eat too much or do we eat too much because we're overweight <laughs> and this brings up the right. issue of leptin resistance, but yes. I love how it, you bring it all together. Thank you. And you know, the other, the other really, really key thing is, you know, so these are the things that initiate weight gain and so forth. We believe this is like the main mechanism, but there is this, uh, this problem. And the, the way, the way fructose reduces the energy production is to cause oxidative stress to the mitochondria. So there's this, it's sort of like, um, you know, putting some stress on those mitochondria so they don't make as much energy. And it's an oxidative stress and it's temporary with the fructose. But what happens is when you continue to be exposed to fructose, these mitochondria are being hit again and again and again and again with oxidative stress and they start to wear out and they can actually undergo a thing called fission and they can, they can become damaged. And what happens is uh, as we get older, the, these mitochondria actually start to get lower in number. And so we kind of uh, re lock, get locked into a low energy state and that wants to keep us obese. So then if we lose weight, you know, and if we if we really have low mitochondria, it will be very hard to to uh, to stay keep the weight down, unless you're just like starving yourself, um, and because just eating small amounts of food will tend to cause weight gain. So, so what we have to do is um, we have to uh, repair repair those mitochondria, and you know this is where exercise and all these wonderful techniques are out there to try to stimulate mitochondrial growth. And there's even people now uh, doing mitochondrial transplants in animals, which is really, really uh, wild. But, uh, you know, it seems to me that, um, you know, the, the two things to, to try to stimulate the mitochondria to come back, the first thing is you got to qu quit injuring them. And then the second, because they will recover just by, by stopping the injury, they will recover slowly, but then we have to accelerate recovery. And their exercise is probably one of the very best ways. Uh, but there's, you know, all these tricks, dark chocolate, vitamin C, green teas, all these things can actually stimulate a little bit of growth too. So, so that's really where the next step is, is how can we get, bring back our mitochondria? And if we could bring it back to the way they, we, we had them when we we're 20, we're going to have the energy of a 20 year old. Great, Richard. So, you know, you, you clearly stated that uh, in terms of um, the sugars, fructose is, is the worst in terms of uh, damaging yeah. mitochondria and oxidative stress. And so, look, we have this other fuel, which is fat. And so I thought you were kind of heading to make the statement that the uh, 
eating such eating fat in general might be a way to reduce oxidative stress in the mitochondria, but you didn't specifically say, say that. So well, low carb diets, they work. So actually we did a, we did some studies with low fructose diets and low, uh, low salt diets, and we can stimulate mitochondrial numbers in people just by reducing sugar intake. And I'm sure it's true for low carb. It's probably even more powerful. It would be fantastic to do studies with the keto diet or with a low carb diet, looking at how it affects the mitochondria. I don't think there's been that many studies that have done that, but it should really stimulate mitochondrial growth. Um, and I do think that um, there are a lot of people who feel that when they go on a low carb diet, that they start feeling just a lot better. Um, but, but it's hard in this world for a lot of people to successfully stay on a low carb diet, just because of the environment, you know, you can't, you know, you can be on a low carb diet and like if you're traveling and they take you to a, a place where they're serving the food, you know, it can be tricky. You know, you, you have to like pick and choose, but it's like, you know, it's hard. I think it's not, not so easy for everyone to do that. Um, so so, you know, the challenge is there, but um, you are probably one of the great leaders. You're certainly the greatest leader in this whole region uh, for, for um, helping people get them on a low carb diet or a keto diet. Uh, and you've had great success, um, but it's, it is, t uh, you know, it, it, it's a challenge. You, you, you know, I, I, my hat's off to you for all you've done to help people. Um, and, uh, you know, what kind of, when you are doing your, giving your diet recommendations, what percentage of people will still be on a low carb diet, like, uh, six months later, is it pretty good right now? A year? Well, well, I just teaching people, first of all, thank you for the comments and, you know, nutrition education is my legacy. I'm not a researcher. So this is, you know, we, we both make significant contributions and, you know, I still enjoy working in the healthcare system and, you know, helping pay patients and individuals navigate through the landmines of healthcare. Right. That's, that's kind of where I sit and teaching people how to, to eat better is rewarding uh, since I've learned uh, better myself. And yeah. indeed uh, it is sustainable. And uh, we have uh, success stories of, of people losing weight, improving their metabolic health, uh, looking at longevity. You know, I wish I could say that we're a clinical research center, but we're not. But in a sense, they're all anecdotes because we don't do research, sure, sure. but we have one anecdote after the, yeah, no, that's the other, good. Richard. Yeah. So, I, you know, I want to back up. I'll, I think we could go on all day with this, but I'm really fascinated with mitochondrial health. And 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 I gave a mechanistic talk several years back looking at um, oxidative stress and mitochondria. And I would tell you, before I got on stage, I had done um, a significant amount of research and even had spoken with Michael Eads and Peter D, who's hyperlipid. And... Um, discussing this this mechanistic um, perspective that uh, in fact uh, the 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 oxidation of um, uh, fat through mitochondria and and looking at the at the at the mem the mitochondrial membrane that that fat serves as kind of a it produces energy but much more slowly compared to glucose. And, and that may be a mechanism that yeah. reduces oxidative stress. And, you know, I would say that would be interesting for you, your group to, to, to yeah. look into that and, and, and specifically how um, fat versus carbohydrate affects oxidative stress in the mitochondria. I think that makes a lot of sense. That, that's a very, very good idea. Thank you. Well, look, if Gary Taubes can do it, why not myself? <laughs> I listen. I I uh, am a person who I'm very curious, and I love comments from anybody, uh, especially person people like you who are so much expertise. But um, it doesn't matter who you are. I'm going to listen because that you know I a good idea can come from anybody, and um, yeah, and if I listen, I have a better chance to pick up those ideas.
Well, Richard, thank you. And, you know, just to our audience, if, when you're listening to Richard talk, how, how he simply explains things and he's so approachable. And this is the beauty of having you come to our event and you can meet people in person. And uh, I don't think we've ever had this much time to, to speak with one another. And uh, yeah, it's a great delight. It's a great delight. I, I feel some warmth coming from you. That's <laughs> that's wonderful. Uh, there's a lot of warmth I have for what you guys are doing. And you know, the more the more I I study, the more I I realize the how great the low carb diet is. And I do think that it uh, you know our work is now linking this fructose pathway with uh, Alzheimer's, and we have a paper that will come out soon on this. And um, you know, it really looks to me like carbs has a, have a major role in driving Alzheimer's and, you know, that a low carb diet should have really significant benefits in, in protecting, uh, especially in the early, earliest uh, phase. You know, again, it's one of those things, once you start losing the mitochondria, the game is no longer to prevent the injury as much as it is to try to bring back the mitochondria. But, um, but either way, this would be a, you know, low carb diets really look like a great approach for general living. I think we're eating too much carbs well, right now and we should, you know, the right percent, I don't really know what it is, but there's a lot of people eating 50% of their diet is carbs. And I think that's probably too much. Yeah. Well, Richard, it's all going to come together. So we have Chris Palmer and Brett Scherer will be talking about uh, uh, psychiatric health, brain health. And Wonderful. Uh, I, I think, you know, at the at the end, people will really get a good perspective from, from, yeah. from all angles. And so, you know, you didn't say it, but I'd like you to at this point, uh, what the what the switch is. Yeah. So the biologic switch is really triggered by the metabolism of fructose. And fructose is the only nutrient that lowers the ATP. And so it lowers the ATP about 30%. It can be from 10% to like 40%. And the lower it goes, the stronger the activation of this switch. And the switch is this thing where you start getting hungry, thirsty, you're foraging, you start accumulating uh, fat, you start eating more than you normally do because you become leptin resistant. You drop your resting metabolism. So when you're not foraging, you actually drop your energy levels even further in terms of what uh, burning the energy. And you, your blood pressure goes up. Uh, you start putting fat in your liver. You know, it's the whole nine yards. It's, the, it's this thing we call metabolic syndrome, but it's, it can be even expanded a little further. And so that's the biologic switch and animals use fructose or make fructose as a way to do this. And it's meant to help you. It was meant to help when you didn't have food around that you could get these fat stores so that you could make it through winter. You could make it for that long distance migration without having to stop to eat or whatever. You could use your fat as your energy source. But what's happened is we keep activating this and we are not hibernating and we are not going on long distance migration, <laughs> you know, flights. And so what's happened is we're, we're accumulating this and we're becoming pre-diabetic and then diabetic and we're developing fatty liver and then cirrhosis. Then we're developing elevated blood pressure and then hypertension. And, you know, it just gets, they, they progress from one level to the next. And before you know it, we're very sick. And, uh, and it's because of this switch. Thank you for saying it. And so, <laughs> you know, your research started with uric acid. Right. And it brought you to fructose, fructose. And now, uh, you know, David Perlmutter writes a book, Drop Acid. Right. And he's referring to uric acid. And now you're back on uric acid. It's kind of come full circle. Yeah, no, I mean, I never really left uric acid. If you look at my research, I've, I've been doing uric acid research all through this. And um, we definitely think that it's playing the role in how fructose works. And uh, David is a wonderful author, David Perlmutter. I recommend you guys to get that book. Um, and, uh, you know, he and I are good friends. And, uh, and we talk a lot about uric acid when we do meet. Um, and... Uh, and I, you know, 
it's it really appears to be still appears to be a very very important risk factor underappreciated that people should be measuring and you know i'll make sure to talk a little bit about it at the meeting with well, you. you know, we tried to get Dr. Perlmutter, but he had a conflict. So maybe oh, in, a, in next next conference, we'll have him. Uh, yeah, no, he he's gonna, wonderful, yeah, absolutely you're, wonderful. You're gonna you're gonna do a great job covering all these topics, I'm sure. <laughs> so thank you. Yeah, well, great, Richard. Well, I you know we can finish up, and uh, always want to ask, what is it that you enjoy about coming to uh, conferences in person? The ability to meet people. You have a real, uh, you know, quite a few stars, uh, a lot of people who I've always wanted to meet. And I saw that you've now just invited Cynthia Thurlow and she's, um, and Nina Tycholtz. And some of these people I've, like Nina, I wrote a paper with and I've never met her personally. And um, I was on Cynthia Thurlow's podcast once and and uh, she's really quite an, uh, a wonder, remarkable person. And, and you have a lot of people that I looking forward to meeting. And uh, I will say that, you know, ideas are stimulated by conversations. And when you talking to people with lots of interests and lots of different viewpoints, it is a fantastic opportunity to get new ideas of, of how to move the needle forward. Or backward, but hopefully forward. <laughs> well, con continuing the conversation, and uh, Richard, again, you're you're such a humble guy, and uh, you know, you didn't you didn't say I, I want to get up on stage and have have these people praise me because of all the wonderful information I'm going to be sharing with them. It's quite the opposite. No, I, no uh, I'm looking forward to learning from them. To be honest, wow, that that's amazing coming from such a distinguished professor as yourself and that's why we want you at our event well thank you <laughs> and yeah so how can the audience find out more about you so i do have this book nature wants us to be fat it really summarizes a lot of the new work and you can get it at almost any bookstore um, amazon books a million um, i have a website drrichardjohnson.com I, I have an instagram dr richard j johnson and i have a Twitter account that I'm just learning how to use called Richard J. Johns, J-O-H-N-S 11. And so it's at Richard J. Johns 11. But anyway, so um, the best probable way, the um, best way to reach me, I probably is through my website uh, or you can try to email me. I have, I, my email is available uh, through PubMed. You can find a paper and I, there's a lot of papers where I have my email there. Great. Great, uh, Richard. Well, if you want to hear uh, Richard in person and also the other great speakers that we uh, just mentioned, uh, please consider attending in person or live to the conference in February. And for more information about the conference, please visit lowcarbconferences.com. And it's important to understand that uh, we can't have the conference without you, the audience attending, and your attendance really supports nutrition and science. And so uh, we really appreciate everyone being at this event. So thanks again, Richard, and uh, we'll certainly be in touch. Yeah, thank you, Jeff.